we good? Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, oh, the camera's back there. Um, thank you all uh, for uh, participating in this uh, virtually. Uh, and thank you to those of you who are able to be here in the room. Uh, we just wrapped up a terrific uh, summit, uh, the second open source software security summit taking place here in Washington, DC. Uh, this was a follow-up to a meeting that was held uh, virtually in Janu on January 13th, uh, where a number of us uh, came together along with folks at the, uh, the National Security Council, ONCD, and other uh, government agencies to talk about the state of security in the open source uh, landscape and really identify some key problems. Um, it, since that time, many of us in the OpenSSF community and, and beyond uh, worked together on a plan, uh, a plan that we debuted today uh, here at the event, uh, along with uh, our stakeholder from OpenSSF, but also with a broader uh, set of industry partners, open source community partners, and of course, with our friends in, in the White House and in, in government. Um, this plan's now, now available on the website. Uh, the details of it uh, are, are, are there in the plan. It represents uh, a collective effort uh, against 10 different targets uh, that we've identified as a meaningful or where meaningful work could actually be applied to make a su substantial uh, improvement in the state of open source security. Uh, they are, uh, they should be viewed as a first draft. Uh, in fact, I think we labeled it version 0.9.1, uh, but with some specific goals and some specific uh, uh, approaches to uh, addressing those key problems. We will continue to work with uh, the stakeholders here. Uh, now that it's public, we'll also be looking for new participants in uh, further development of that plan. Uh, I, but it really, I think, represents uh, a great flag in the ground, as we said, uh, uh, for uh, further evolution and um, state of security in open source software. Uh, I, we had at the meeting today, I believe it was 80 different individuals uh, from over 50 different organi uh, organizations of all sorts, uh, representing uh, all sorts of different viewpoints and priorities. Um, but there was so much that we were able to come together around uh, and, and meaningfully, uh, I believe, come together in a, in a consensus around the, the plan that we put together. Um, we're also pleased to announce that a subset of organizations uh, have decided to make the first set of financial pledges towards the plan. Uh, let me be clear, the plan called for uh, about $150 million in spending over two years across those 10 different lines of effort. Uh, we realize that's a meaningful amount. We realize that is uh, uh, an amount that uh, from some degrees is much more than any one open source developer has or even, even most open source projects. Uh, but when you compare it to the cost of uh, remediating a major vulnerability out there like we've seen in the last few years, is a drop in the bucket of a, a very small a, a ounce of prevention to spend to get to many, many pounds of, of cure. Uh, and we are able, happy to announce today that we've got uh, the first set of pledges towards that plan. Uh, we can announce $30 million uh, in funding from a set of uh, our partners to be allocated uh, as time goes on across those streams, as we refine the plans, as we converge on specific uh, milestones and specific uh, fundable achievements. Uh, but these are pledges that, that are incredibly meaningful. Um, those pledges come from Amazon, Intel, VMware, uh, Ericsson, uh, and Amazon. Amazon, VMware, Intel, and Google, and Microsoft. Thank you. Um, uh, I, it also does include $10 million uh, of that amount is from Amazon as well. So uh, we're incredibly thankful. Uh, I'm so nervous that I'm forgetting my own name, let alone uh, my members. So apologies for that. Uh, I, uh, and uh, I, we will work with those as well as many others out there that uh, are learning of this plan that we aim to collaborate with to refine each of those different elements of the plan uh, and move forward on. So uh, we're incredibly thankful to those uh, partners. With that, uh, I've given you my, my take on the day. I'm a little biased as kind of the, the um, you know, ringmaster of the circus, um, but I uh, really wanted to also open the door to the chairwoman of our board at the Open SSF, Jamie Thomas. Uh, Jamie, uh, would you like to introduce yourself better than I could and then um, tell the world about that? Well, thank you, Brian. I'm Jamie Thomas and I represent IBM at the Open SSF and I'm really pleased to be here. First of all, I'd like to thank Brian Bellendorf uh, and Jim and all of the Open SSF members and of course the government for their participation today. I think it was a uh, really a strong uh, example of collaboration and what we can accomplish going forward. Particularly like to, to thank as well uh, Deputy National Security Advisor Ann Newberger and her staff for being here all day with us and contributing uh, in a meaningful way. I think this 
exhibits our intent as an industry to really create an execution plan uh, to make a big difference here in terms of cyber security going forward. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of execution details that we have to work out, but I think it was a great step forward and truly uh, just really want to commend the collaboration across all the participants today. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and Sarah Navadi, Sarah represents Microsoft. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry, uh, you and Microsoft have been a tremendous partner for the OpenSSF. Uh, uh, you helped with uh, the January 13th meeting, you helped in putting this together as well. Did you want to share a take on uh, today's event? I'd be happy to. So I'm Sarah Novotny and I lead open source strategy for Microsoft. And I am <clears throat> very happy to see what we've done here today. It's bringing together the community excitement with the constraints of industry and the constraints of government and finding a path to wend through all of those things. And then to do that together and even just finding the common language in that 50 page document that we've pulled together as a starting point has been a huge amount of effort and has been worth all of the time that we spent on it. And we will see, we will see rewards from this in our industry, in our government, and, and in our collaborations going forward. I love that we have as many companies as we do, more than 30 now, right, um, working on this, and we would welcome any others of you. I'm also very much looking forward to taking this plan that we've started, we've outlined and drafted, and getting more feedback on it and more people engaged with it to drive it across the whole industry. Um, and for uh, last comment, I want to uh, just pass the mic to my boss, uh, the uh, executive director for the Linux Foundation. Jim, this has been a passion of yours for a few years now. Um, yeah. Can you comment on the moment here and kind of what happened in the meeting, but putting that in the context of, of the last 20 years of finding yeah. better open source? Yeah, so, you know, I've been working in the open source community for almost two decades. And in that period of time, we've had multiple cases where uh, a vulnerability in an open source component has posed, you know, dramatic risk to a broad set of society. You know, a heart bleed in 2014, uh, most recently LogForge, uh, you know, really put us all at risk. And we've all spent a lot of time remediating these things. In that period, we have systematically tried to get help to the hundreds of thousands of open source developers who are out there and to the leaders who are responsible for critical components of the open source supply chain to help improve the baseline of security. Uh, and today it, it is one of the first times I've seen a actionable plan with concrete goals, but most importantly, an industry will to offer that help in a meaningful way. And, uh, we're in the first five minutes of a long game. Um, the urgency here could not be greater. Adversaries are getting more sophisticated. Supply chain attacks are happening more often. Uh, and cyber conflict is escalating around the globe. Uh, but just, I, I couldn't be proud of the work that Brian and, and the team have done, but also just at every level in the organizations that have convened here, a serious commitment uh, to bring help uh, to all of the developers globally who write the code that makes up 80, 90% of all the technology products and services most of us rely upon every day. It, it is a serious milestone. Uh, having uh, the Biden administration, uh, Deputy Secretary Newberger, or Deputy uh, Newberger, Thanks. Advisor Newberger, um, helping with this, you know, working in coordination with the public sector and this great private coalition uh, is just incredibly gratifying for someone who's been in, in this uh, world for quite some time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I, we are still working on the readout document from this that'll include quotes from uh, many of the participants. Uh, we were actually scrambling to collect those in real time uh, uh, between the end of that meeting and the beginning of this. We will get that to you very soon. Uh, we're just uh, closing up uh, the loop on many of those, uh, and we'll get that out but also as a press release uh, over the next few hours. Uh, so um, I, we know there's some some gaps perhaps but before we get that out, um, but I, I, again, uh, really, we're, we're excited to have hosted this meeting, excited to have pulled this community together. Uh, very thrilled by the validation that has come from the series of pledges, uh, but, but beyond that, we know that, that industry and the public sector are really coming together uh, to, to address this. In fact, it's really nice to see this complement the, um, uh, the hearing yesterday uh, that the House Committee on uh, uh, Science and Technology
technology hosted, uh, focusing exactly on this topic, on uh, open source software security, and to see the enthusiasm uh, uh, amongst uh, the policymakers for asking, what can we do to help? How do we, uh, what's the investments, what are the investments we can make? To, to be that ounce of prevention um, uh, was really gratifying. Uh, as I mentioned to the room, 2009 me, uh, when I came here first to work uh, at the White House in the Office of Science and Tech Policy, talking about open source software as a public good, um, uh, that, that person's brain is blown uh, by just how far the conversation has advanced here in DC. Um, and I'll end with, we are eager to engage beyond uh, the United States as well. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, we're looking forward to conversations with other, other public sector actors around the world about how to align efforts, how to build upon each other's work, uh, and how to, to, I mean, really open source software is a global phenomenon, uh, and we're really eager to work with everybody who's, uh, who finds uh, resonance with the plan that we put forward. So I think with that, um, I'm looking at my staff to see are there any other messages that I forgot, anything worth getting out? Uh, and I do not have a mouse to be able to see what the <laughs> questions are. Uh, um, uh, is there a oh. way? Okay, why don't we start with this? Um, uh, I'll just start with the first one. Um, Sean Kerner asks, big question, what was the biggest surprise for you, Brian, in the hearings yesterday? Well, as I mentioned, the fact that um, the opening statements from the committee members were uh, showed that they and their staffs have actually recognized both the role that open source software plays in critical infrastructure and the opportunity to turn some modest investments actually into outsized uh, returns in the form of reduced risk. What was great is it allowed me to cut my oral testimony in half and actually fit it into the five minute window uh, because they said what, what I usually feel like I have to say in making that case. Um, uh, I think there was also the funny moment when um, I, I mentioned I'd rather use open source software that had bugs that were found and fixed uh, than one that hadn't. Uh, and uh, one of the committee members asked, oh, I hear you right, are you really rather use software with more holes? And I just had to say, and fixed, because that represents not only software that's being used, but also software that's being addressed. Um, uh, but uh, that is actually valuable enough that people are fixing it and a, and a process that is mature enough to get those fixes out there to the world. Um, but let me turn to other uh, members here. Was there reflecting on the testimony yesterday um, and, and maybe the themes of today? If I, I, I don't know if, uh, if either of you had a chance to see. I haven't it. been yeah. able to watch the testimony yet. Okay. Uh, I, not, not a problem, uh, but, I, but really, you know, many of the themes came up of where to invest in education, in scanning of code, in the distribution points, um, and third party audits, you know, uh, many of that align. And what I would say today is just the uh, unfettered participation, if you will. I think everyone felt very comfortable in stating um, their, the, their concerns or their uh, recommendations uh, from their point of view. And I think it was the, those unique points of view will help us fine tune the execution plan and be much more effective. So I think that was very good. Very good to see. Thank you. Um, just yep. sorry to interrupt, Brian. Uh -huh. Let's just give a little announcement because we have some virtual viewers here today. Great. So we've got, first of all, thank you everyone for joining us here today. We've got some journalists and members of the press attending virtually and some people here in person and we'd love to field all your questions. So first of all, to the people attending virtually over Zoom, please submit your questions through the uh, live Q&A function. We're going to go through them. We're going to promote you to a panelist and give you an opportunity to ask them. Uh, we're going to give you some time to submit those questions. And we'd like to start by fielding questions from people in the room. Would anybody here like to ask a question to the panelists? you feel like you've come away, you know, just obviously it's a broad document, lots in it. Is there one thing that is the most important um, strategy for changing or making, you know, open source more secure? I'll turn to- I mean, what is the news, I guess? What do you consider the newsiest aspect? Well, it was interesting to me how often in our conversation today, as we were talking about one stream, the, it came up, well, this uh, actually would benefit from or resonate or depend upon even success with the other stream. This is really a portfolio approach. Yeah, in some ways you're asking me to pick which of my children are my favorites. Uh, so I apologize for, for that, but uh, um, I, it, it really is, uh, it requires a cohesive effort because there's not one root cause uh, or one root approach that's going to address them all. And it's industry recognizes that. I think the, the public sector partners recognize that as well. It was nice on the one year anniversary of the White House Executive Order 14028, uh, 
uh, to have a fair bit of our conversation be about softer bill of materials and making that meaningfully adopted. Uh, what does it take to actually not just come up with a good spec, but get it used by the open source community? Um, I think that's been a large part of our work together. Uh, and it was great to see even just the interest in that and the reflection of that around the room. Yeah, I mean, I think the big news is, is similar. Like a year after the executive order on cybersecurity, we're here now with an actionable plan. And what I find most compelling is just the industry willpower. You know, folk, folks from Google say, we have people that we're going to put on this to go and fix vulnerabilities. You know, folks like Amazon committing financial resources against this plan. Um, many of the folks in this room also committing, you know, both the expertise, which in many cases uh, around cybersecurity matters only rely resides in industry, uh, but also financial commitments as well. We've never seen that amount of unified will uh, to significantly raise the security baseline for us collectively. And I, I think that's just an incredible accomplishment, you know, only six months after, you know, we all suffered from a major open source vulnerability, the White House uh, and, you know, Ann Neuberger brought us here. Uh, and, and now we really have a plan that is already being taken into action but now has significant additional resources to carry it forward in a meaningful way. That, that's a big milestone. I'll, I'll add something if you'll give me a chance, Jamie. Um, I think that the big news for us is that we are looking at this from multiple different perspectives. And while we have 10 streams, we don't have to pick a favorite child because industry needs some things done, government needs others, and we're going to work on funding all of it in some balance. Yeah, the only thing I would add is I think this really um, ensures that we all understand the importance of open source, uh, how productive it's allowed us to be, and our obligations obligation to consider the uh, implications of using it, right? So I think that was a fundamental understanding out of the first two meetings is that open source has allowed us to all be productive, but we have an important stake in making sure it is secure and that all of our downstream clients get the benefits of that security. So uh, can't agree more with the comments from Brian and others that these things kind of all come together to ensure this open source community can be uh, effective going forward and that it can be uh, uh, secure at the same time. Great, thank you. Any other questions from people in the room? Great, well, we'll move on to our virtual participants. I think I believe I saw a question from Eric Geller on the on, on the uh, screen if there's any possible right. to, to pop that in. Yeah. Uh, so Eric Geller, we're going to promote you to panelists that you can ask your question. Yeah, if that's possible, or I could just read his question. Um, hey everyone. Uh, oh, thanks so much. I appreciate you taking my question. Uh, so what's the timeline for allocating this initial 30 million? Has any of it been earmarked for any specific purpose or is it all up for grabs? And, and did any of the other companies say that they might be able to make additional pledges um, in the near term? Yeah, um, the best way to think of it, I think, is as a venture capital fund, right? Uh, where here's a set of 10 uh, investment worthy uh, 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 targets, uh, streams. Uh, each one of them has a business plan. Each one of them will have to justify the investment. Uh, that 30 million in pledges represents uh, a, a, a fund that will uh, uh, spool out, we expect to over the course of a couple of years, uh, but it's the beginnings really of what hopefully will be a larger fund to cover the, the $150 million that we identified. Now, you, you know, as the plans evolve, as we find ways to save money, as we adjust the targets to the available funding, uh, we'll right size it to the opportunity. Um, but this is by no means a, uh, a final funding. This is the first uh, uh, down payment, think of it that way, or down, uh, first tranche of investments into the fund. Um, yeah. So it's really going to though be up to the funders uh, as we work through the plans to, to say, this stream is good, this one is now ready, um, let's come in and, into this and, and push it forward. Uh, and some of these activities are already begun. Yeah, I think it's also important to understand where money helps and where also time and expertise helps from the organizations that are represented in, in the room today. You know, for example, just doing an audit a third party audit of critical open source code bases is something where you need financial resources to pay an audit firm to do that. 
once you find problems, you also need assistance from expertise and developers who are very sophisticated to go actually fix those problems. And in some cases that will uh, come from organizations who have that expertise in house that are allowing their employees to spend time remediating these vulnerabilities that are found in the audit. So what you'll see is a blend of both financial resources, but then hands-on assistance from subject matter experts. And it's the combination of those two things that makes for the highest impact in the shortest period of time. Yeah, I can't agree more, Jim. I mean, we I like this VC analogy. I think it's a great ongoing VC fund. Uh, but it is uh, an obligation of all of us who have these skills to make sure that we're contributing uh, individuals and their expertise to the open source community, open source projects. And Sarah had a great comment in the meeting that I'll just <laughs> give her credit for is that we all have to recognize those individuals in our enterprises for their contributions to open source. And so I do think that's an obligation that we have to take on because that's how we encourage them to do this and not just quote volunteer their evenings for this, but make it a part of their day job. One more thing I'll add before we move on to the next uh, question. We internally polled uh, our membership at, at OpenSSF, uh, the, the, the leaders in the community, and asked, how much money are you spending today on securing open source software? I don't mean by giving away your product for free. I mean, by actually sitting down and doing some of the kinds of hard work we talk about here, being a part of existing OpenSSF efforts uh, or, or efforts uh, across other parts of the open source landscape. And even just with a few responses to that, we quickly came up above $100 million in direct spend and almost 100 full-time engineers. And so this is an industry that's taking this quite seriously already. This funding and the resources that, that might come from it uh, are added to that effort. Uh, uh, and, uh, and also we're very eager to open the door beyond uh, OpenSSF's participants and, and look for other sources of funding to help complement uh, this, this um, initial tranche. Okay, well, I think we're ready for the next question. Is Thank there, you. Uh, anyone else? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sean has asked us to read his question out. Okay. How are the targets in the new plan different from some of the problems the Linux Foundation's core infrastructure initiative, CII, tried to solve years ago after Heartbleed? Yeah, I mean, I can. Uh, so I started the core infrastructure initiative after Heartbleed, uh, um, essentially to get direct financial support to the maintainers of OpenSSL, who at the time, really, you know, we're, we're doing this uh, as, as a very, very small group of developers in a very highly specialized area of cryptography. Um, and that was a case where just supporting a small set of individuals to do some work on critical projects that they really had a unique understanding of was helpful in the short run. But what became very clear to us and what this work builds upon is that that alone is just not sufficient, that you have to provide a set of resources that, that include training of developers about how to write secure code in the first place, tools that allow them to do better testing, you know, uh, a better DevSecOps you know, set of, of tools so that they can release code securely. Uh, back then, the complexity of the overall software supply chain was not as uh, uh, difficult as it is to manage today. The explosion between 2014 and 2022 of small reusable components that have become the building block of modern software and that are distributed through different package management systems has created a, a level of complexity that's extremely difficult. This plan is very comprehensive direct support for developers, seconding engineers to solve problems, providing audit of code bases so that we can find vulnerabilities from a third set of eyes, going to the you know, sort of friction points in the supply chain where package managers could use additional security, both tools, time, and um, <clears throat> resources to, to improve just the ability to do package signing upon distribution of software components, et cetera, et cetera is what is very different here. This is far more comprehensive. And the final thing I would say, which I, I said originally, is it's bought into at a far more senior level from government and from industry than any time in the history of open source because this threat is immediate, it is complex, uh, and, and people here are taking it very, very seriously. Thank you. A next question is from James Rundle at Wall Street Journal. James, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for doing this. Really appreciate it. Um, 
so just noting that there's been a, a pretty significant commitment from the private sector and also taking on board what uh, Jamie said earlier about Anne Newberger spending a lot of time with you guys today and her team. Um, what support will the US government provide for implementing this plan moving forward? Have you had any commitments from them in terms of uh, skills and expertise, in terms of maybe leveraging their procurement power? I know there's been talked about that in the past. Yep. Uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, go ahead, yeah. I, I, so I, yeah, so there is uh, no part of that fundraising dollar uh, amount that comes from the, the US government or any others. And, and I just want to be clear, we were not here to fundraise from the government. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we are aware of interesting wins on Capitol Hill about uh, around investment in this space. We're hoping that they and, and the administration uh, can understand what we're doing, uh, uh, the, the, the types of targets that we've chosen and what we think is required to hit those. And uh, that may serve to inspire certain actions or, or the like. We do hope to make sure that what we do is additive to existing efforts. Uh, there's an interagency effort inside the White House uh, across ONCD, uh, OMB, and, and, and NIST and others uh, around complementary efforts focused on SBOMs and other parts of the supply chain. Uh, part of that was a conversation today about uh, ways that we can be supportive of each other's work, um, uh, but we we uh, do not you know did not uh, in this in this uh, plan anticipate needing to go directly to government to get funding uh, for, uh, to, for any of it to be successful. Uh, nor is it a part of the thirty million dollar number. Uh, but we're all very hopeful. This is a plan that benefits everybody, you know. And government is a major user of open source software and is starting to create open source software and distribute that as well. Uh, uh, so we're we're we think we have a lot of alignment in terms of interests, and we're eager to see. Um, the public sector get involved in elements of the plan. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think <clears throat> one of the highest value things that, you know, uh, Ed Newberg has brought to the table is the convening function and leadership that's required. You know, I think it, it, in the meeting we talked about, you know, you can't go fire hundreds of thousands of developers if they're not writing secure code. It requires leadership. It requires someone to convene and to help us create a culture of security uh, in the software supply chain and in open source, and uh, the White House has definitely, you know, demonstrated that kind of leadership. Uh, the other thing that's important is there are already uh, things going on in the government around uh, cybersecurity that uh, we want to make sure we align with in order to one get faster time to benefit and two reduce uh, duplicative effort. And then finally, I'll just repeat again. Uh, a lot of the expertise around cybersecurity for this particular aspect of it resides in uh, the private sector, and the private sector is stepping up in partnership with government to provide that expertise in a meaningful way. So just that, that public-private partnership and coordination uh, is, is critical to getting the quickest time to impact from this particular effort. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks, James. The next question is to Kyle Alsback from Protocol. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, just wondering if you could say a little more on SBOMs. Uh, you know, how does this advance SBOMs? What, what new uh, things does this do for that effort? Thank you. I'm happy to jump in on this. Uh, all right, well, um, you know, it is, as I mentioned, the one year anniversary of Executive Order 14028, which uh, really identified software bill of materials as a key enabling technology to provide greater traceability to software, open source or not, in supply chains and in hosted software and that sort of thing. Uh, uh, but coming up with a spec specification, coming up with a file format isn't enough. Uh, you need to get this technology adopted and you can create demand for it uh, uh, through things like procurement, which is what the Executive order called for. Uh, but if it's at the tail end of the supply chain, then certain folks are going to hold it uh, and make that a competitive advantage. What we, we believe needs to happen in the open source space is to have those that all that SBOM activity, the traceability, the generation of these bills of material uh, as they flow through to move as far upstream as they can, right? To get open source developers who operate at the, the library level, the Component level, you know, way at the beginning of that chain, uh, to un understand the value of it, to be interested enough to to lift a finger to integrate it into their build systems, uh, and they'll only do that if it's easy. They'll only do that if uh, there's if it's a part of the tooling that they use, right? If it helps them get their code to more people, right? So the plan that we put forward calls for uh, uh, investment into libraries, into technology that make adoption easier, 
uh, that go to key open source projects and uh, uh, embed it into their build systems. That builds a reusable library uh, focused on uh, a certain approach, but one that uh, we believe is compatible with the major different SBOM approaches out there uh, and builds bridges uh, between uh, so many of the different distribution systems that are out there today and, and, and uh, art artifact inventory kinds of systems. So uh, uh, that's the key part of this stream. It's very nerdy. Uh, it made some hard technical choices. I, all these streams are very nerdy. I apologize for that. But uh, uh, it made some hard choices that are about making sure for the money we can spend, we get the most bang for the buck. And it really, in the best of open source, is about building these components that then we hope gets get reused and, 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 and enable a lot of other change across the entirety of the software supply chain. Can I add one thing? Sure. So one of the other things that is critical in this SBOM work <clears throat> and we're trying to make that the case is this is a request from industry and enterprises for this to meet a government specification. A lot of our open source developers are accidentally famous. So we really need to make this SBOM generation super simple so that it is not putting toil upon the open source developers that we already depend on so much and get so much leverage for the amount that we spend <clears throat> contributing to open source as, as, en as enterprises. So we very much need to make sure that this is not putting additional toil on those open source developers and that we are bringing our industry weight to help and make it simple by using those choke choke points, wrong, wrong word, but those, those key aggregation points, key leverage. points of leverage. Well, and the recurring theme as well about not creating more burdens <clears throat> upon right. open source developers is yeah. a key part of the plan across the different streams. Yep. yep. The easiest way to think about it is to understand how software flows. It comes from a developer's mind to a version control system, to a package manager, to a build system, to a consumer. That's the simplified view of the world. There's a, certainly a much more complex way to think about it. The important thing is to build software at every one of those points that automates the liquidity of software bill of material metadata so that it seamlessly flows. The outcome here, if we can build this software, will be a high degree of software bill of materials liquidity in data across the entire supply chain. That is the end goal we're looking for. Yeah, I, I just add in, I think, Jim, you make a really important point. Number one action on the list today was education. But in fact, we'll probably ne never educate everyone fully on the topic of security because it evolves every day. So automation and the instantiation of automation through things like this bomb are actually critical in codifying the education for the open source communities and those that consume open source. We have a question from John Gregg at the record. Are there any log4j-esque issues on the horizon? What projects are key to software that are of concern? Uh, boy, I um, well, we we published a report with Harvard uh, called the Harvard Census Two, uh, uh, which uh, took a look at uh, basically systematically across all open source software and tried to identify the pieces that are most critical, the pieces that the most other pieces of software depend upon uh, and uh, play perhaps a hidden role uh, that maybe don't get the light of day that, that they should in terms of attention to their, their software quality or to the other kinds of processes that could lend themselves to, to greater security. Uh, so I draw his attention to that uh, as, a, as, a, as a way to kind of try to understand where, where the potential risks are. Uh, and we certainly believe that's been useful to our, certain organizations to help bolster the defenses by trying to identify these packages. Um, uh, uh, the second thing to say is, you know, no, none of us have an omniscience and can tell you where the next log4j will come from, uh, uh, except that, you know, there are, there are vulnerabilities found every day. I, I, and I, even just in the Linux kernel, I think every week there's a release that addresses a couple of things. And an important point here is software will never be perfect. Uh, I, it, it, you know, uh, the only software that doesn't have any bugs in it is the software with no users. Uh, and, and so uh, what's important is how do you find them before uh, the bad actors? How do you get them fixed uh, as quickly as possible? And then how do you get that fix permeated out there into the rest of the world? And I think systematically you do that, you can build a resiliency and a response capacity um, for whenever the next uh, major vulnerability hits. You brought up an interesting point in that <clears throat> earlier in the day where you said, you were surprised by so many different uh, pieces of software that said they weren't vulnerable to the log4j issue because they had not 
even upgraded to the up yeah. to the version that was that was uh, at risk. For clarity, yeah, the log4j 2.x was the one that had the vulnerability. Yep. Log4j 1.x, which had been out of support for five years yep. uh, and had lots of unknown vulnerabilities and un unremediated vulnerabilities. Yep. And many organizations said we're not worried. Uh, right. and, and open source projects, by the way, yes, there were open source projects there, as well. Depending on log4j, not not to get yeah. anybody off the hook here. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, and and what it brought out was we simply are not good even within the open source community. Yep. about updating our dependencies, clearing out technical debt. Uh, and this is something that uh, we believe many of these streams will help help address. This is exactly the proliferation of the fix is the is yes. another whole problem. It was an entire this. goal of yeah. the three. Yep, yes. yeah, exactly. Thank you. We have a question from David Jones at Cybersecurity Dive. David, would you like to ask your question? Okay, we'll read your question, David. What is being done to make sure the open source community is properly compensated over the long term beyond these initial investments? Yeah, I, I can quick address that. The, you know, for a lot of large scale open source projects, such as the Linux kernel, uh, projects like Kubernetes and others, you have a pretty robust economy of, in many cases, professional developers who work on those projects because so many organizations use them for their fundamental products and services. So those companies in the upstream of its source project, and you have sort of a virtuous cycle of investment in those uh, larger scale, uh, well-supported open source projects. Where things break down is the intersection of critical to society and often ignored and underfunded. And in those cases, unlike the consistent pattern of a sort of a virtual uh, cycle of, of goodness in the big projects, those uh, individual projects tend to be very Tolstoy-esque. They are each sort of uniquely unhappy in their own ways. It could be uh, that there are people looking at it, but they just uh, are missing certain security vulnerabilities. It could be that there's a key maintainer that uh, just suddenly becomes famous because that code is so popular and everyone's asking them for feature improvements and bug fixes. And, you know, this isn't even their day job and they need to be compensated. There are a few ways to uh, fix uh, better aligning incentives with open source developers. One, some research that we've done shows that uh, individuals would love to get more time from their employers to work on those critical open source projects understanding what those projects are in terms of criticality and then working with employers to give them more time to do that work as a maintainer certainly is something that we can do. In some cases where it's just direct funding to developers who need that help in order to continue to maintain these critical projects, those are things that we should look at too. The point is there's no single solution uh, much of the research that we've done also shows that many of the developers that uh, are working on these projects do it for recognition, for uh, being a part of something bigger than themselves. And again, that's where an employer uh, who is working with uh, those individuals should recognize them, to Sarah's point, and provide them time uh, in their regular day job to go work on those things. So it, 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 it's a complex set of uh, financial decisions to make sure that we align incentives correctly. Money is one of them, but it's certainly by no means the only thing. Yeah, I think we also learned from Log4j, which had been out there for about 21 years, is that often our developers gravitate towards the newer, most glamorous open source projects but we still have an obligation to serve those most used projects which will be more like the log for js So one of the things I know that we're all assessing are our, our most used projects. We've certainly done that in the case of IBM and committed more resources to those most used projects, which means we have to recognize those developers as Jim has stated. Thank you everybody for asking your questions so far. We've exhausted all the questions from our virtual reporters. Are there any last questions in the room before we close off? No, all right, well, I'll leave it to the panel. Thank you, everybody. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.